Welcome to the 2020 Candidates Forum. I'm Jean McFarland, the Program Monitor. This segment features the candidates running for the state representative in the 103rd Assembly District. Before I explain the format, I'd like to introduce the candidate in attendance running for state representative in the 103rd Assembly District, Liz Linehan, Democrat. Due to the schedule conflict, Pam Salamone, Republican, is unable to participate. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked to the candidate by the members of the local media from the Record Journal. The second part will allow the candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer portion of the program, the candidate will have two minutes to respond. To conclude the program, the candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. Mike Gagney, would you please ask your first question of Ms. Linehan? Yes. Good evening. Hello. Um, Ms. Linehan, um, earlier this season, uh, your opponent, Pam Salamone, uh, her campaign sent out a mailer to constituents um, stating that you were in support of a so-called forced regionalization of school districts um, that doesn't appear to have you know, been borne out by your voting record um, on the bills that passed uh, last year. But um, what is your position on regionalization um, and whether or not it should be state mandated or you know, locally um, decided upon? Thank you, Mike, very much for that question, and you are correct. My opponent did put out a mailer that stated falsely that I voted for school regionalization, forced school regionalization. As you noted in your question, that is indeed false. The bill that I voted for was actually one that started out as regionalization, but because of the work that I do in the Education Committee, I got that bill changed to only talk about shared services and purchasing agreements between districts just to save us money, right? I mean, it would save millions of dollars for school districts every year. So, and it's only a study to do so. With that said, the reason I got that bill changed was because I do not support forced school regionalization. Lauren, would you please ask your question of Liz Linehan? All right, good evening, Liz. Hi. Uh, Connecticut recently reached a 3% COVID-19 positivity rate for the first time since June, and more than 200 people are now hospitalized with the virus. What plans would you support to mitigate a third wave of COVID infections? So a couple of things that we need to do. You are absolutely correct that the numbers keep growing. Um, and we need to look at the fact that it is indeed a second or possibly third wave, as you're saying. We also need to make sure that it's not what's known as a twindemic. A twindemic would be the um, rising rates of COVID along with rising rates of the flu. And what that would do is put our residents even at more risk, and it would also take up hospital beds, and we would see greater hospitalizations and greater deaths. So one of the things that I have been doing already is educating uh, my constituents about where they can find a flu shot. Here in Wallingford, there have been um, numerous flu clinics. There's also some in Cheshire and Southington, where I also represent. Additionally, I think it's really about education at this point. We need to make sure that people understand what they can do to minimize the risk of catching COVID. And that would be the typical things that we talk about. Um, wearing a mask, hand washing, social distancing, um, and, and keeping our groups to a minimum. Um, so I have made it my purpose to continue to educate folks on that. And additionally, we just need to make sure that we listen to the science. There are plenty of scientists that are giving really great information that if we just take a moment and recognize that we put the greater good before us with a few inconveniences, we can actually get past this second or third wave or a possible twindemic with, a, with the least amount of casualties possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, would you please ask a question of Liz? Yes. Um, this is on the police accountability bill. Um, as stated in the previous um, you know, foreign candidates, uh, the most controversial aspect of that bill um, includes changes to uh, qualified immunity, um, which makes it easier for 
those individuals who believe they've been wronged by police to file lawsuits against officers, departments, etc. Um, as legislator, um, now that the bill has passed, uh, what changes might you propose in the future, or um, how would you, you know, view the, the impact of the bill as it currently stands? Absolutely. Let me be very clear that there has been a great deal of misinformation about this bill. My opponent has claimed, erroneously once again, that the passage of this bill is what is responsible for violence in the streets in our cities. That couldn't be farther from the truth. The reason why there's violence in our cities is because of COVID, because of economic issues, of kids not being in school. So uh, I believe that her statement that this is the reason uh, that we're seeing an uptick in violence in the cities was a racist dog whistle. And so I'd like to get that out there, that that is indeed untrue. With that said, qualified immunity actually is a federal doctrine. So the issue in the bill is essentially that it mirrors the federal doctrine so that yes, now residents can sue um, in state courts instead of just federal courts. But keep in mind that the high bar set in the federal doctrine is the same high bar set here in Connecticut. So no police officer can be sued unless they have willfully and wantonly violated the law or someone's civil rights. So if a police officer uh, doesn't violate the law or violate someone's civil rights, there will not be an opportunity for them to be sued. Additionally, what the bill does is it requires that police departments indemnify their officers. What does that mean? It means take out an insurance policy on them. So in case of a lawsuit, that the town and the police officer are covered until such time that that officer has, found, has been found guilty. So there's been a lot of misinformation. Police officers aren't losing their homes. Police officers will not be sued um, unless they violate the law. With that said, what I would like to change um, is the um, consent search clause. I believe that consent searches are important, and I was told the night of the passage of that bill that we would be coming back before that law went into effect to vote and change that. That was supposed to happen on special session on September 30th, but the minority leader of the House of Representatives has said that she refused to bring up that bill uh, because she wanted it to be a campaign issue. I believe police officers should not be a campaign issue. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, would you please ask the next question? Sure. The State Department of, the State Department of Labor issued a stop work order earlier this year against a Wallingford massage business that was listed on a website featuring user-generated reviews of sexual services. The incident exposed a lack of specific state or local regulations over massage businesses and what police say are the limitations of law enforcement to conduct extensive undercover operations. What can be done at the state level to curb human trafficking and prostitution in Connecticut? Thank you so much for that question. This is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So first of all, what the state needs to do is fund police departments and their ability to do undercover operations. This to me is hugely important. There is a desire for police departments to go out and do those undercover operations, but there just isn't the funding. So I'm going to look to uh, put forward a bill that increases funding specifically for those purposes, not just for massage parlors, but we're also talking about undercover operations for children on the internet. We know that especially now with kids spending much more time online at home during the pandemic, that this has become a major problem. So. Um, this past legislative session, I did put forward quite a few bills that address this, this issue. And in 2017, I passed a law, um, a new law that is commercial sex abuse of a minor. And um, if someone is trafficked as a minor, this law would, um, is, is a uh, class A or B felony. We now, for the very first time, um, had a conviction where a man in Manchester um, who was looking to purchase a youngster for sex, was actually um, sentenced to 30 years. I don't think it's long enough, and I'm going to continue to work on that. But there are many things that we can do to educate parents, educate kids, keep them safe, lengthen sentences, and ensure that we have a better monitoring system for those on parole. Thanks. Thank you. Mike, would you please ask the next question of Liz Linehan? Yes. This next question is concerns of racial justice and inequality. Um, what should white elected officials do to ensure that they're representing constituents of 
all races and ethnicities. It's a lot more simple than you think. It's about listening more than talking. I would meet with people who are directly affected and I would ask them, how can I help? How can we educate people? What can we specifically do to ensure that everyone is treated equally? And then I would stop and listen. That's hugely important. And with that said, uh, the pa in the past year, I'm not sure if it was 19 or 18, I did pass a law regarding social emotional learning in schools which actually has a racial component to that. The Social Emotional Learning Collaborative works to educate children on racial disparity and to uh, talk to them if they are um, victims of racial bias. Um, and so I think that as we begin to move forward in this time where racial justice has become at the forefront of all of our conversations, it's necessary that while we're having that conversation, that people in my position need to do more listening than talking. Lauren, would you please ask the next question of Liz? Okay. In light of recent threats to the Affordable Care Act and Roe v. Wade, what should the state do to protect vulnerable populations facing possible loss of health care coverage and access to reproductive health choices? Thank you so much for that question, because when I knock on doors, I hear a lot about that from women. So I want to be very clear. I believe it was 2017 or 2018, I put forward a law that would codify a woman's right to choose in state statute. At the time, we didn't move it forward because we didn't feel that there would be the need. Now there is the need. I promise that I will put forward that bill when reelected in January to codify into state law a woman's right to choose, regardless of what happens on the federal level, because uh, they're probably going to leave it to the states. Connecticut has always been a state that um, supports a woman's right to choose, and I will work to ensure that. Uh, additionally, I have had a very strong record in keeping protections here in Connecticut for, um, for that very purpose, that we don't know what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act. So I did write and pass a law that codified into law the 10 essential health benefits of the Affordable Care Act, um, and that overwhelmingly passed, and I believe that was 2017 or 18. I'm getting my years mixed up again. Um, and additionally, I put forward a law that um, codifies uh, pre-existing condition coverage into um, state health care. So what happens is, is that um, people, if they have a pre-existing condition, they are now covered. There will always be um, a coverage, there will always be coverage for them on the state level. So whatever happens in these, um, with, this, um, with the courts, just know that there are Connecticut representatives who are working diligently to ensure that our health care remains affordable and accessible. Thank you. Mike, would you please ask the next question? This next question concerns climate change. Connecticut is experiencing statewide drought after you know, the blow of the tropical storm Isaias. Mm -hmm. Stark reminders of what is to come if climate change is not taken seriously. Now, how would you balance you know, the state's economic needs without pulling the rug out from underneath future generations who you know, might be impacted by climate change? Yeah, so um, this is where being a moderate really comes into play. Climate change is real. Let's just get that out of the way. Climate change is real, it's happening, and we need to stop it. But what's also happening is that we are having um, economic difficulties moving from our reliance on fossil fuels over to more sustainable green energy. So what we need to do as a state is prepare our local businesses to be able to grow and change with the status of climate change. I like to say, that government is like this giant barge, right? And we are going down this stream or this, this river really on momentum. And if we turn on a dime, what happens? We either get stuck in the mud or everybody falls off. So the important thing is, is we know we have to turn things around. So let's do it in a calm way that makes sure that our local businesses don't fall off. How do we do that? We invest in green jobs. We invest in green energy. There's a bill um, before, that'll be before the legislature this year that actually um, encourages more solar. We did pass a law uh, that took some solar credits away from municipalities. We're looking to replace those solar credits 
so that municipalities can jump on board and save some money and actually be kinder to the environment. We need to look at incentivizing businesses and consumers to do that, which will ultimately also grow jobs and save the earth. Lauren, would you please ask the last question of Liz Linehan? All right. Already? Already. Oi. Okay, sorry, make it a long one. I'm having a good time. All right. According to the State Department of Labor, mm. the state has recouped about 60% of jobs lost in March and April at the start of the pandemic. However, in mid-September, uh, state unemployment rate was estimated to be 12 to 13 percent, and currently about 232,000 people are collecting unemployment benefits, and the state recently announced that they had have hit the uh, million application mark um, yeah. since March 13th. So how would you spur economic growth and job recovery? So first we have to um, point out that uh, I looked at the unemployment numbers of the towns in my district, Wallingford, Cheshire, and Southington. And each of them are at least a point lower than the state average and more so than the national average. So that is a good thing. However, moving forward, when we're talking about the economic recovery, there's a couple things we need to remember. That jobs are not going to come back until we get COVID out, uh, until we get out of COVID, until we get it under control. Significantly, a number of people I talk to, they're concerned they don't have the consumer confidence. So if we follow the science and we do the right things to keep COVID under control, then that's what's gonna start bringing people back, feeling comfortable going into stores. You cannot possibly be anti-mask and pro-business. The two don't jive. You need to be able to feel comfortable going into a business and that means making sure that residents feel safe doing that. So until we address those issues, the economy is, is not going to bounce back as far as much as we'd like. So I think the main issue pressing right now is getting control of COVID, making sure there's consumer confidence by us doing the right thing by science, and getting back to a safe reopening. And then we can make sure that we focus a lot on our federal delegation to bring in those dollars from the federal government to help us with recovery. And that will help us keep our sectors open, keep, get people back to work, and get hopefully back to normal. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. The candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Ms. Linehan, will you please begin? Sure, thank you so very much. First, I'd like to express that um, I'm, I'm saddened and disappointed that my opponent wasn't able to attend tonight. I hope everything is fine. Um, but it was my honor to be here for everyone uh, and, and talking to the lovely people at home. Um, I have been your representative now for two terms. Uh, it has been the honor of my lifetime, and I hope to continue to do so. When I knock on doors, people um, are quite aware of the work that I've done, and that's because I've been open and accessible um, and, and talking with everyone for the past four years. And in that time, I've learned what you guys have wanted me to fight for on your behalf. So because of your suggestions and you telling me your needs, I was able to write a bill that eliminated the state income tax on social security, pensions, and annuities for middle-class families. I did that because you told me you needed me to do that. I have brought in over $50 million a year in education funding for our schools in the district. I've also brought in municipal aid. Those things are the things that actually keep your property taxes down. Because the more money that comes in from the state, it means the less you need to pay in your property tax bills. I believe in strong schools. Um, and I believe in um, strong, vibrant downtowns, which Wallingford really has, and I'll continue to support that. Additionally, I've done an incredible amount of work during the pandemic. I've helped over 1,000 constituents get either unemployment, um, help with their health insurance, um, and a variety of other issues surrounding the pandemic. I think that the very favorite part of my job is, this, is the interaction one-on-one -on -one with the people that I serve. And I really hope to continue to do that. If there is ever an issue that affects my constituent, it affects me too. And so I'm going to get to work. I have been very thankful um, for the opportunity and I hope to continue to have the opportunity moving forward after this election. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you both for your questions. I appreciate you. As Pam Salamone, was unable to make it this evening due to a conflict. She has provided 
us with a written statement. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you live this evening, but I thank you for the opportunity to share three key planks in my platform. Although this is my first run for political office, I'm proud to have the support of the National Federation of Independent Business. I've spent a lifetime involved with small business and I've seen how poor public policy has devastated our state economy. We must end the spend and tax cycle and return to the principles of fiscal responsibility and economic opportunity, which make our state and nation strong and prosperous. Economic growth is the principal answer to our problems as a society. Business will rebound when we reduce the crushing burden of taxes and regulation that has driven industry and productive citizens out of the state. Local business owners and homeowners struggling with high taxes know I am the only candidate in this race who can be trusted to fight all attempts to stick us with another massive tax hike after the election. Instead, I will work to reduce wasteful spending and restore our economic health. I'm also endorsed by the Cheshire and Southington Police Unions in an unprecedented show of support for my candidacy. They recognize that I will stand proudly with our local police officers, unlike the incumbent who supported the disastrous police accountability bill. That ill-considered legislation hinders proactive policing and makes officers and their families personally liable to frivolous yet costly lawsuits. Keeping us safe in our homes and secure in our property should be the first priority of government. I will always back our local police in the tough job they have to do on our behalf. We have strong schools in our district because our towns have made education a priority and parents have been involved in the process. We don't need the state telling us how to teach our children. I will oppose education mandates from Hartford and depend local, or excuse me, defend local control of our schools. Forced regionalization of our school districts, which would put our schools and the property taxes we pay to support them in the hands of big city politicians is a real threat. Parents, students, and taxpayers know that I am the only candidate in this race who would fight school regionalization every step of the way. Electoral politics is a rough and demanding business, but I want to do my part to make sure our children have the chance my husband and I had to grow up in this beautiful state, to find rewarding work here, and to raise families of their own. I know what the job entails, and I will be true to my principles responsive to my constituents, and vigilant on behalf of the communities I represent in your, as your state representative. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I invite you to email me, or excuse me, email me at pam at pamsalamone.com or message me on Facebook at Pam Salamone for state representative. All my best, Pam Salamone. This concludes the 103rd Assembly District segment of the 2020 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford Community Women, I thank you for watching and remind you to please vote on November 3rd.